Next up, we are talking with Dr. Zach Berta Thompson, who is a professor of astronomy and planetary science at CU Boulder with a specialty in studying exoplanets. His research ranges from mid-sized bodies and their atmospheres to small planets around small stars to what he calls wonderfully complicated stars. Now within the student body, he's especially known for his stellar shoe collection, his love of arts and crafts, and his enthusiasm for for teaching and advising students of all demographics. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Berta Thompson. Thank you for having me. It's delightful to be here. We are super excited to chat with you. So first thing we want to ask you, kind of maybe a simple question. How long have astronomers known about exoplanets? How long have we been observing them and studying them? Ooh, that's a... Good question with multiple answers. It, <laughs> it could be like one answer is sort of forever, right? There's, I, I think people have looked up at the stars for a long time and lots of different cultures and lots of different humans have wondered about those stars. And there had been ideas around for a long time that those stars were somehow related to our own sun. And so if they're our own sun, you know, who, who knows, maybe, maybe something about those stars was related to planets and creatures living on those planets far away. I don't know. Um, a more specific, precise answer is that um, really, I think in the early 20th century, astronomers started talking about this semi-seriously of, oh, maybe there are planets around other stars. Uh, what would it take to, um, to find those? And for a long time, that was kind of out of reach of anything that was technically feasible. Uh, but people kind of dreamed about it. Oh, maybe someday we'll be able to do this. And then I think the first actual like published detection of a thing that today we would call an exoplanet came in 1989. Astronomers found a um, they saw, they looked at one particular star and they saw it wobbling back and forth um, in such a way that indicated that there was an object that was maybe about 10 times the mass of Jupiter orbiting around it. And at the time, they didn't call it an exoplanet. But nowadays, we would consider that a thing that is probably an exoplanet. So uh, the, I think to actually get to an answer to your question here, maybe that's uh, about a little over 30 years, we've had measurements and actual data and observations of things that are planets that are vaguely something like in our own solar system. Um, so it's kind of, this, is, this is a really big question and you can answer it in whatever capacity you'd like. But the question is, how do we find exoplanets? And to kind of, you know, add on, what are the greatest challenges and victories of exoplanet research and kind of exo, you know, looking for exoplanets? Sure, yeah. So uh, as, as you said, that is a big question of how do we find exoplanets? There are oodles of, of ways that we find them. You, one could teach entire classes on this topic. Um, the, I'll talk about, I think that's the, maybe the best place to start is with the challenge here of, if you take a planet like the Earth and put it next to a star like the Sun, if you want to take a picture of that Earth-like planet, it's, you know, it is, uh, you're trying to take a picture of something that is one ten billionth as bright as the star that it is orbiting. And you're trying to do that from a really, really long way away, right? If we have if stars are sort of the scale of a light bulb, we always like to have a nice kind of physical scale model that we can talk about here. If a star is the size of a kind of normal sized light bulb, then the distance between stars is comparable to the like size of the Earth right now. So you're trying to detect this enormously faint, tiny little thing orbiting next to some bright light bulb, but from across the country, say. And so in that case, it's always, that's why this, it's been difficult to find planets around other stars. One of the, I'm happy to dive into more details, but one of my favorite methods is to use what we call the transit method to detect planets around other stars. 
And that is the simple idea that if a planetary system happens to be lined up so that the planet passes in front of its star as seen from Earth, then that planet is going to drop or we'll start that phrase over again and you can re-edit it. Okay. So the way this transit method works is if a planet happens to be lined up so that it passes in front of its star as seen from Earth, it's going to block a tiny fraction of that star's light. And that fraction might be really small. It might block 1% of the star's light, 0.01% of the star's light. So that's like, seems like really small numbers, but we're here, we're relying on the fact that astronomers have been practicing for a long time at measuring the brightness of stars. And so we've gotten pretty good at it. So with telescopes like we have today, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, the Kepler Space Telescope, which just ended observing a little while ago, we can make these super duper precise measurements of the brightness of a star and do these wonderful things. Like, first of all, tell that there's a planet there because you see this little periodic dip in the brightness of a star. You can tell how big that planet is because a bigger planet is gonna block a larger fraction of the star's light. But the technique fundamentally is one that's been around for a really, really long time. I, I always like to bring up one of my favorite astronomy heroes. Uh, this is Henrietta Swan Leavitt. So she was an astronomer working at the, I guess we have to stop saying like turn of the century, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Um, oh, I guess I'm old. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, an astronomer working in the early 1900s who, at that time, the tools that they had were photographic plates. You could like go out and basically take a photo of the sky and then come back to your lab, do lots of complicated chemistry to develop that photographic plate and then spend some time pouring over it with a little magnifying glass and comparing it to other little reference stars. And with those photographic methods, she could, uh, I think, measure the brightness of a star to like about 1% which is, is pretty good. It's like almost good enough to be able to detect a planet. And is this uh, there are actually like some planets today where... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this was uh, early 1900s. So often it was, um, they, were, they were all ground-based telescopes. Um, and often they were pretty small, like maybe uh, just a few inch size telescope taking a really long exposure glass photographic plate photo of the sky and then going back afterwards and measuring the brightness of those stars. And there's a lot of like cool fundamental astronomy that came out of being able to make precise brightness measurements. And nowadays we use that for studying exoplanets, but at the time that was learning about variable stars, which then taught us how to measure the distance to stars, which then taught us how to measure the distance to galaxies, which then taught us that the universe was expanding. So there's this whole beautiful long legacy of astronomy that goes into making precise measurements of the brightness of stars. And nowadays we're just kind of riding those coattails by using this method to find and study exoplanets. Very nicely said. That, a, that was a that was a great response to this huge, you know, entire course long question. <laughs> Thanks. So one of the cool. things that um, we talked with Jessica about is how all of the exoplanets that we're finding are drastically different. And we're finding some weird stuff that we don't see in our solar system, kind of like the mid-sized planets specifically and ones that you study. We don't see planets the size, like between the size of Earth and Neptune. We don't have that in our solar system, but we see it a lot in exoplanets. Does the fact that these exist kind of say anything about the way that we think of planetary formation? Yeah, so I think the, to me, that's the, the greatest, conceptual gift that we get from exoplanets is this understanding of the diversity of worlds out there and kind of filling in all the gaps in our solar system like we planet formation is a stochastic process it's there's a lot of randomness and chance that goes into what planets form around a star in a lot of our astronomy classes we teach that a, a star is kind of a, a simple thing and maybe that's an oversimplification but um that a star, in a lot of cases, it's you can tell its whole story based on the mass that that star originally forms with. 
uh, like if if the star has a mass that is a half the mass of the sun, this is what's going to happen to it. If a star has a mass that is exactly the mass of the sun, this is what's going to happen to it. This is what happens to a 10 solar mass star. You can follow those trajectories pretty accurately with sophisticated but fundamentally understandable theoretical models. Planets are a lot more complicated because you have this, like there's that star at the center of your system that is forming, or maybe there are two stars there. And then there are all of these kind of random chance collisions and, occur and occurrences and accreting of different things. And maybe a star flies past your system at the right moment and introduces some torque and spins things around. So with all of this randomness, you can end up with, re there's no way to predict exactly what planets are going to form from the initial conditions from a an early protoplanetary disk. We have some models that make some general predictions about populations and probabilities of things forming, but you can't we can't point at a forming star and say, I know exactly what planets are going to form around there. So it's this chance to get to explore. This is one of the things I love about astronomy is that we get all of these surprises of things that we can't that we didn't predict ahead of time but we can learn about by observing them and try to piece things together into some sort of coherent picture. And so, as you mentioned, these uh, one nice example of it is these planets that are kind of intermediate in mass between Earth and the rocky planets in our own solar system and the ice giants in our solar system. So planets like Uranus and Neptune that are maybe I don't know, 10 to 20 percent hydrogen helium and complicated on the inside. We don't really know because we haven't said anything to visit them yet. We should do that. Um, so we have um, our planet, which we understand pretty well. We have these already sort of mysterious planets in the outer solar system. And now, thanks to the population of exoplanets, we have kind of a whole range of planets in between in there. So there are fundamental questions you can ask, like, what is the biggest possible rocky planet? That's a thing that you can start to determine once you have hundreds of planets that, that fill in between here. And it seems like uh, there aren't any rocky planets that are bigger than about eh, two Earth radii, maybe like somewhere from 1.6 to two Earth radii. Once you get bigger than that as a ball of rock, you inevitably start accreting hydrogen and helium and lots of gas and you sort of balloon up into one of these um, much much more gaseous planets. But we didn't know that until we had these um, this population of planets in between. The Another example on the other side is these uh, planets that Jessica Libby Roberts, so a grad student working with me, has been studying are these super puff planets, these ones that are, uh, you know, a few Earth masses, but the size of Jupiter. And Jupiter is 300 Earth masses. So that's a, like, that's a big contrast there. And so these are planets that we think have somehow managed to accrete a lot of hydrogen helium gas and they're still relatively young. And so they're puffed up while they're still cooling down and they'll, they'll shrink as they cool. But they're like weird, like fundamentally weird planets that give us a nice opportunity to, to study how planets work when pushed to these extremes or these limits that we don't have examples of in our own solar system. Do you think that, you know, so I know that our idea of how planets formed, you know, just the, just the formation of planetary systems in general has changed quite a bit, you know, as these discoveries kind of happen, you know, when we start talking about these, these intermediary planets or these intermediate sized planets or the super puffs, do you think that like, you know, eventually we'll reach this conclusion that we can kind of predict what sorts of planets will show up given, you know, some, some scenarios, or is it so chaotic that it's, it, you think it will always kind of be one of those things where you just have to wait, you know, uh, however long to, to, you know, watch the planets show up and, and then you can say what they are. I don't know. Uh, which is such a like, that's, that's always such a wonderful answer to be able to have in science, right? Uh, I genuinely don't know how to predict an answer to your question. It, um, it might be the case that we can, um, by observing enough exoplanets and across a, a range of 
system architectures, like different sets up, setups of planets and across a range of different types of stars and a different type of ages and combining that with theoretical models, maybe we can tie everything together into some sort of coherent picture where we can predict at least in a statistical sense of, uh, you know, there's a 10% chance you'll end up with a system like this and a 90% chance you'll end up with a system like that. But I don't know. This is, again, we're, we're like kind of at the early stages of this in the same way that um, we were at the early stages of understanding, um, what's a good example here? Uh, let's let's go with like Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. Again, back in the 20s, 1920s ish. I really have to be careful here. Um, uh, there were, we had spectra of thousands of stars, hundreds of thousands of stars with measurements of the brightness of that star at lots of different wavelengths. And you saw these little absorption lines in those that we could link to materials that we have on Earth. You saw hydrogen lines, you saw calcium lines and iron and all of these different lines that were indications that we knew that these elements were present in stars, but we didn't really have a great way of thinking about um, what, what are those actually telling us? And so then along came Cecilia Payne at the time, this was before she was married, so she didn't have her hyphen yet. Um, so Cecilia Payne, as a PhD grad student, used this wacky new science called quantum mechanics and applied it to spectroscopy and stars and worked out that if you look at a star like the sun, there are these, the sun has sort of relatively weak absorption lines from hydrogen. So it's like, naturally you wouldn't think that like, well, obviously hydrogen is the most important thing there, but she did these complicated calculations. She worked through a lot of like, many pages of complicated math and wound up with this conclusion that, oh, those relatively weak hydrogen lines in the atmosphere of the sun are actually an indicator given the sun's temperature that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the sun. That was the thing that we didn't know before. A long time people have been like, there are these really strong calcium lines. The sun must be made out of calcium. And so it was, I think at before she did this work, nobody really could have predicted this like, obviously hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. We know that now. And that is an essential tool in which we can kind of link together all aspects of astronomy is like really relies heavily on that fact. But it was this combination of digging through the observations that had already existed, but we couldn't quite make sense of yet. And then applying this new theoretical model to them that we were finally able to um, to link things up and she could start making sense of astronomy in this really fundamental sense. They're starting with stars. For planets, I know we're, you know, we, we have all these little pieces that, that are starting to fit together now, but I think there, something like that is always around the corner, right? That some, uh, that some new scientists or group of scientists will make some connections that we weren't able to see before that will allow us to have this this big jump forward in how we understand the universe. And that's kind of, you know, how like as science grows up, the more we learn about, you know, any kind of system or any entity, you know, then then the more we can predict what, you know, we can make predictions about that same thing. So uh, that makes sense. We, so we talk about stars how how the way that a star's life will kind of look is largely based on its mass, right? So I guess I'm wondering, uh, in your website, you mentioned that you're working to, quote, understand the basic stellar astrophysics of small M dwarfs, which is a kind of star, M dwarfs, to help make them better laboratories for exoplanet evolution experiments, end quote. What role does the kind of star play in the formation of the existence of any planets that are orbiting it. So again, we don't quite know yet. <laughs> okay, oh, um, great. So, uh, no, 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 we're, we're starting to get inklings of this. And I think the first, um, one of the, 
like I think early on in the, dis the as we started to discover the first exoplanets, a lot of the searches for planets focused on stars that were very similar to the sun. Very naturally, like let's let's look for a system that we would understand. Um, and so we'll start from a star that is about the mass of the sun. And so we, it has a, a life story that is pretty similar to the sun. And so we think we can figure that out. Uh, but then as, as we started to find more and more planets, we started branching out into these, um, uh, to a broader range of stars to search for planets. One, uh, there's a really nice reason to search for planets around small stars, mostly just that the smaller your star is, the easier it is to see a, a small planet around it. And so there's understandably a lot of interest in finding planets that are small, relatively small and cool like the Earth. And so there's a big push to look for planets around uh, M dwarfs, these, these really small stars. Uh, and so, but now, like now that we have kind of thousands of planets, people have been able to do the, start to do these statistical estimates of how common different types of planets are around different types of stars. So one, I think I'd, I'd like a really classic breakthrough study on this was led by Courtney Dressing, who's now a professor at uh, UC Berkeley, not CU. Sorry, the whole Colorado, California thing always gets mixed up. So uh, one of these really important studies was led by Courtney Dressing, where she measured for the first time how common small planets were around M dwarf stars, these, these small stars. And she found that they were way more abundant than around stars like the sun. And here, this is still a kind of limited view. We were thinking about things that are relatively closer to their stars and a little bit hotter, but just even that initial gem of, of an idea that, that grew out of the data that um, it seems that small stars for whatever reason like to form relatively more small close-in planets than a star like our sun does is probably telling us something about how planets form around these stars we uh but we don't quite have that that full picture yet so i think that that's one of these clues that is ultimately going to get linked together as we think about how planet populations change statistically uh, around different types of stars So one thing I want to ask, just kind of from a personal standpoint, so you talk a lot about looking at whole populations of exoplanets around this kind of star or, you know, these kind of planets or these kind of planets. So right now in our solar system science, there's a lot of debate on whether we should be looking at, like you say, going to Uranus and Neptune to get more of a, like, broad understanding of our solar system and then there's also a whole category of people who think that we should really focus on the nitty-gritty of Enceladus or Mars or really focusing on these archetype planets. Is that something that we've gotten to with exoplanets yet or do you see it kind of moving in that direction where people really want to focus on maybe one specific exoplanet or type of exoplanet or is it still more of just like a broad conceptual overview kind of study field yeah that is uh you've uh you've really hit on a an and that split is absolutely present in the exoplanet community as well and both of this is this is a, a classic both and situation right where both of these things are are really useful and really essential and um and can work together both with planetary science in our own solar system and beyond so the the populations are really useful for telling answering these these kind of big broad questions of how does planet formation relate to star formation and things like that but there are also we also have methods to study individual exoplanets in much more detail and we and so we've already said that if you watch when a planet passes in front of its star and sees what fraction of light that planet locks, you can tell how big that planet is. So you can measure its size. You can also, by knowing the orbital period, the year of the planet, you can tell how far away that planet is from its star. So you can tell how much energy it receives from its star. Is it effectively is it hotter than Earth or cooler than Earth? Um, and by how much? 
You can then also look at, as you look at, if you measure the star wobbling towards us and away from us with a radial velocity spectrograph, this is the Doppler wobble method, you can learn about the mass of the planet. A more massive planet is going to tug on its star more and cause it to wobble more. You can also figure out the details of its orbit. Like, is it a circular orbit or is it an eccentric orbit in some oval where it's like sometimes it's going really close to the star and really fast and then spends a lot of time far away moving really, really slow. And so you can figure out kind of the whole architecture of the system. But then you can also look, if you make very precise measurements, at aspects of the atmosphere of a planet or the sometimes in some cases even the surface of a planet where so for example if you watch when a planet passes in front of its star the first thing you measure is oh there's a little dip in light because that planet has passed in front of its star but if you split up the light from that star into lots of different wavelengths into lots of different colors then you can measure how big is that planet at lots of different colors at lots of different wavelengths. And so what that allows you to do is look for absorption lines from different molecules or atoms that might be present in its atmosphere. And, or the case of like scattering from hazes in the atmosphere, something like that. So you can, if there are whatever element that you're interested in will have its own unique spectral fingerprint that you can pick up if you look at light that has filtered through an atmosphere. This is a lot of how we like measure gases in general, is we shine light through some gas and we look for this spectroscopic fingerprint of whatever gases we're looking for. And so in the case of the Earth, like that shining light through our atmosphere is something that we get to experience every day at sunrise or sunset, depending if you are an early a morning person or an evening person, where at sunset you have this really beautiful red color that happens, right? From That's where you're seeing the sun sending out light that travels through space and then travels a long way through our atmosphere. So you're actually looking through more of Earth's atmosphere at sunset than you are at um, uh, like when the sun's high overhead in the sky. And so that causes the sun to look redder in color because more of the blue light's getting scattered away. And then if you look at Earth from really, really far away, it actually means that Earth is like effectively about 10 kilometers bigger at if you look in blue light than if you look in red light because the blue light is getting blocked and the red light is going through the atmosphere. And so that's a thing that we can measure from really, really far away. As you can imagine, 10 kilometers is a lot of kilometers but it is small compared to the size of a planet, especially a planet that you are trying to study from many light years away. And so in a lot of these, uh, we can make this observation to learn about the details of a planet's atmosphere, but we can make it really only for the very closest transiting exoplanets that exist out there in the galaxy. So there are thousands of them that we know about, but we've tended to focus on, okay, this particular planet, HD 189733b is the closest example of a hot Jupiter around its star. We're going to spend lots and lots of time with all of our telescopes studying that planet in a lot of detail and hope that it will teach us about this broader population of planets that we can't study as much. And so coming back, and so those are both important because we now have, like, we have this broader picture of the, the forest. Right. But you also want to be able to zoom in and look at one individual tree and I don't know, see all the cool creatures that are living in that tree and know what the bark looks like and understand the photosynthetic processes that are going on in it. There's so I think as in all fields, it's really useful to have this balance of focusing on questions on multiple different scales here from the individual up to the population. Excellent. And while we're mentioning seeing the nitty gritty of the little trees, we have to ask the obvious question. Say we confirm the existence of life on one of these exoplanets. What comes next? What, what do we do when that happens from a scientific standpoint, I guess? Uh, I think the first thing we would do would be to be, build a bigger telescope. <laughs> Um, this is, and uh, let me 
clarify here that I think the there are two different, I think there are two, again, complementary tracks along which people are looking for life on other planets right now. One is the effectively the search for extraterrestrial intelligence of saying the way that we'll find life elsewhere is by assuming that that life has evolved to, um, uh, has evolved intelligence in a way that you know effectively makes them able to communicate across in interstellar distances on purpose and so here like if you haven't watched contact yet go watch contact it's the best movie ever and it's exploring this idea of like what happens if we get a message from an intelligent civilization and there in, in, in that book and in that movie there's this um this really important point that Earth has been communicating with the cosmos for about a century at this point in that fashion. Sorry, I should say humanity on Earth has been communicating with the cosmos in that fashion by sending out TV, TV broadcasts and radio signals that could be picked up from a radio telescope far away. So that's like one kind of way of looking for life is life that looks like us as humans. Another complementary way of looking for life is look for life like the photosynthetic microbes and plants on Earth that have pumped our atmosphere full of oxygen. So our, um, so I, I guess if we were starting from trees here, maybe that's the life that we were talking about. Um, that if you look at Earth's atmosphere, we as humans are really grateful that our atmosphere is 20% oxygen. That wouldn't be the case if we didn't have photosynthesis, photosynthesis here. So our plants and microbes have like really fundamentally changed Earth's atmosphere in a way that's pretty uniquely attributable to life. There are, so people sometimes talk about uh, the presence of molecular oxygen with some other gases as well as a potential biosignature as a way that we could find life on other planets. If we look at that planet's atmosphere, we study it in sufficient detail that we can tell that that atmosphere looks kind of like ours and meaning that it has been modified by life, photosynthetic life in this, in this fundamental way, that's evidence for life here. And so in that case, we like, what I really like about that approach is that plants and microbes have been pumping Earth's atmosphere full of oxygen for at least 2 billion years. So that's a, a signal that has for whatever reason, been around a lot longer than we as humans have. And so if we're thinking about these, the vast reaches of space and these really long timescales, a signal that Earth has been broadcasting to space for 2 billion years is one that is really exciting to look for, along with the one that Earth has been broadcasting out into space for 100 years from our own uh, technological civilization. Okay, but back to your question. How, like, what do we do when we find life? Um, I would say we should, um, we want to learn more about it. And the fundamentally, the way that we do that is by observing it from here. I, interstellar distances are large. It is very difficult to travel to another star. And so, um, maybe in some, again, I don't want to predict too far in that future, but I really think the thing that's most, um, our most promising route for learning more about these worlds and what's on them is to, to build bigger and bigger telescopes in a, a way that is like sustainable and reasonable and um, not like putting everything into this. Like, uh, what am I trying to say here? We might need to go back and edit this a little bit. Um, I think we should try to observe these planets as, as closely as we can from as far away as we are. I feel like that would be incredibly frustrating in one sense <laughs> that we can find all this stuff, but it's like you said, like hundreds of light years away in most of these cases. Do you think this is something that might like kickstart a revolution in space travel people would be even more enthused and excited to build 
maybe all near light speed travel? Or do you think this will kind of something like that might bring around sort of a technical revolution to try to get us there? No, it's kind of a philosophical question. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. This is, it gets at this, it's a really big philosophical question, right? And this is, this is one that we already struggle with a little bit in our own solar system in thinking about the planetary protection associated with visiting worlds that we can actually get to here in our own solar system that we want to make, like, we made darn sure that Cassini crashed into Saturn where it burned up and vaporized instead of onto the surface of Titan where who knows maybe like maybe somehow the microbes that we sent into the outer solar system on Cassini could have possibly survived in, a, in an atmosphere like Titan. Um, we need to be real like in the world's history we haven't um, we haven't done a great job of protecting life that already exists in a place when we arrive in that new place. Um, particularly talking about humans here, right? Like like we've messed stuff up in, with colonial, colonialism in our own small planet. And so we wanna be really careful that whatever we're doing in space, um, we're being respectful and mindful of that. Um, like it would be so tragic if we do, sure, wonderfully invent the means to travel to another star system and we get there and we wipe out the life there. That is a like, that is epically bad. Um, and so we want to avoid that as, as much as we can. And so I think that is, but to, to your question here, yeah, I think the detection, the confident detection of life on another planet around another star is, that's a, that's a big thing for all of us to think about and what that means and I, Honestly, I don't know how we'll respond to it. I, I like to think that that is, um, uh, for me, I like to think that that would make me feel all the more protective of Earth as something that we need to take care of um, in thinking about this, um, again, the vastness of space and our beautiful tiny little oasis that can support life here. I, whatever we do to travel to these other worlds, I think we need to be putting um, more effort into making sure that we keep Earth um, a safe and healthy planet for the life that's here already. Do you believe in aliens? I don't know. I love that answer. Um, uh, yeah, probably, maybe, I don't know. Um, I, uh, for me personally, it would be, it's really hard to imagine that life could evolve here, but not evolve on other planets. So I think it exists out there somewhere. I think we have absolutely no evidence that it exists yet. I don't believe that we've been visited by aliens here on Earth. I don't believe that we have um, any concrete proof that there is life outside our solar system, besides that kind of general statistical argument. So I, I really like that this is a question that I, I don't know the answer to, but there are these ways of trying to answer it scientifically, of going out and finding planets and studying their atmospheres and searching for potential atmospheric biosignatures of going out with our radio telescopes or optical telescopes and other methods to look for signs of intelligent life out there um, somewhere that's communicating with us either on purpose or not. But we don't have that yet. So we'll, uh, we'll keep looking. Easy enough. It, <laughs> that question feels like something that would be on NPR where the reporter asks the politician like a very yes or no question. And the politician, <laughs> like, let me slither around that question in every way. Say, yes, I yeah, don't yes, know. Or no. yes or no. <laughs> yes or no. Yes or no. Right. And, and I think this is, uh, is it possible? Yes. Do we know for sure? No, 
those are the concrete answers that I can give you. Sounds good. So we're going to switch a little bit now and get a bit more technical. We'll leave the philosophy off to the side for a while. Um, because some of your work focuses on techniques for precise spectrum spectrophotometric observations of stars. Those are lots of big words. And we've talked a little bit about spectroscopy already with light curves and absorption features, but can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly it is you're working on with these spectra? Sure, yeah, so this is, so let's, uh, so spectrophotometric observations of stars. Let's, um, let's break down that term. Stars are stars. They're giant balls of plasma far away in space. Um, observations are things that we take with telescopes. So like we go to a telescope, we're trying to, uh, that's either on Earth or in space, and we're trying to observe this star. Photometric means measuring light, just generally. And so we talk about um, the methods that we've been talking about so far of studying transiting planets, looking for a little dip in the brightness of stars, is we're looking for a photometric so signal. We're looking to measure a dip in the light caused by that planet passing in front of its star. And so the, the simplest way of taking a photometric observation of a star is to point your telescope at a star, take some pictures of it, and just keep taking more pictures. Like take a picture, and then another picture, and then another picture, and another picture, and then you go measure how bright is the star in all of those pictures. And that's how we found the, the first transiting planets was, was through this method. So then spectrophotometric observations of stars that adding that spectro is saying that, okay, we're still gonna measure the light coming from the star and maybe a planet that's interacting with it, but we're also going to split that light up into multiple wavelengths or multiple colors. So I'm just using wavelength and color interchangeably here because that is pretty reasonable. So here, what we're doing is we're saying, I wanna know how, for example, in the exoplanet case, we wanna know how much light does this planet block at a wavelength of 500 nanometers. We also wanna know how much light does this planet block at 501 nanometers, 502 nanometers, 503 nanometers, at all of these different wavelengths of light. Um, and so, because when we do that, we can hopefully pick up spectral fingerprints of different things being absorbed uh, by its atmosphere. And so doing all of that together is, if you like, the part of observing with a telescope that feels, I think most intuitive folks is, is taking images of the sky, like those beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, that, that really is like, you're taking your cell phone camera and taking a picture. It's exactly the same principle, except with a much bigger lens. For making these, obs these spectrophotometric observations where we want to measure the brightness of the star at different wavelengths over time, you need to have a spectrograph that's installed on the back of your telescope that is still effectively a camera, but it has some other little optics and prisms and gratings and things in there that split light up into rainbows before you record them. And so then that allows you to measure a, uh, a spectrum of the star, its brightness at one particular moment as a function of wavelength. And then you can just take lots and lots of those spectra and from those piece together, how is the brightness of the star changing over time at all of these different wavelengths? That is, on the one hand, that's a like, though it's taken me a long time to explain it, on the one hand, that's kind of a, simple process. You're just like, yeah, I'm just pointing a telescope at a star and staring at it for a long time. Uh, and that's actually a pretty accurate description of what happens up in space. Again, neglecting all of the, the complications, but like the Hubble Space Telescope, you point it at a star, you collect a lot of uh, observations, and you get to measure pretty straightforwardly. This is how bright this star is at this wavelength as a function of time. Do all sorts of cool exoplanet science. From the ground, we have, on the one hand, on the ground, we have much bigger telescopes than the Hubble Space Telescope. And a big telescope is great because it allows you to collect more light to make more precise measurements to be able to learn more about 
a star or a planet's atmosphere. Uh, but on the ground, we also have this persnickety thing called the, the atmosphere, which is pretty transparent, but not equally transparent at all wavelengths. So there are some wavelengths where Earth's atmosphere is more opaque and a little bit less opaque, like even at the like very clearest wavelength, um, gosh, about like 10% of light coming from stars gets absorbed by our atmosphere. And that changes over time. Like as clouds come by, they block out your ability to see the stars. That's a pretty extreme example of it. But even without that, you have like maybe a little bit of water, um, like a slightly more humid parcel of gas drifts over the top of your telescope. And so at some particular wavelength, that water is gonna block light from your star. And so if you want to measure the brightness of your star to 0.01% precision to do these cool exoplanet things, you need to have some way of correcting for Earth's atmosphere with a ground-based telescope. And so that's a lot of the work that we're working on now is trying to develop this method to make it easier to observe from the ground with our wonderful big telescopes that are also easier to get time on than the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but do so in such a way that we can make a really precise measurement of what changes in the brightness of the star are actually intrinsic to the star itself and not to Earth's atmosphere. And so one core component of that is we measure multiple stars at once. So we not only look at this one star and see how is the brightness of that star changing, we also look at maybe one or two or three or a hundred other stars and see how is the brightness of all of those changing at all these individual different wavelengths. And then you can kind of, you can correct for that, uh, the effect of Earth's atmosphere and get back to something that is as close as possible to measuring observations of an exoplanet's atmosphere that happen from space without the complications of our own atmosphere. That kind of answer your question? Well, before we talked, I was thinking, what does precise spectrophotometric observation mean? And now I know. So yes, I would say <laughs> it's spot on. So, so you get this data, right? You, you, you take down the data um, and then you do stuff with it, right? That's, you know, the data is one thing. And then what we learn from it is, is kind of the, you know, where we're going. A lot of what you do is the visualization of complicated data sets. Can you tell us really quick, what does that entail? You know, what, what do you, when you say, okay, I've got to visualize this complicated data set, what does that mean? But also, why do you do it? Is it, do you make these for other scientists? Do you make them for you and your team? Do you make them to share with, with you know, non-scientist civilians so that they can understand what you're doing? What's the whole background of this visualization that you do? Um, yeah, so to answer your last question first, yeah, we, we do this for everyone. This is, uh, I think the, um, we certainly do it for our own sake. This is, this is part of our own discovery and understanding of, but I, I cannot stare at a million numbers and make any sense of them, right? If they are just that's, a table printed out on paper or on a that's screen. That's something that I just, that's a hobby of mine, actually. Uh, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, but, I can look at a thousand pixel by thousand pixel image and learn a lot from it. Uh, and so in, in that sense, the, the visualization is, a, is an essential tool that we have for doing our analysis and making sense of the, the observations and the data that we have. This is not, um, it's not just these, these reams of numbers coming in and everything happens mysteriously inside of a computer and we write these algorithms uh, without looking at things along the way um, and then poof magically an answer pops out the other side. It, it's an, a really essential part of the scientific process. But that's also important for the um, for sharing the science with the, the community at large. I think the the images from the Hubble Space Telescope are a really nice example of this. That those are People put a lot of effort first into building the telescope to take those uh, and then collecting those data and then analyzing those data. And then, but even just the like the work of putting it into the form of an image where colors have been uh, synced up in a way that is scientifically meaningful makes a really gorgeous image that, that 
anyone can look at and appreciate, right? Like like a star for a star forming nebula is the like most beautiful thing ever. But that's also a tool that uh, that you can learn use to learn about the the physical processes going on in there and looking at these these shock waves and these waves propagating and these um, uh, you know these cavities being carved out by newly forming stars. So uh, I think that the visualizing of data is really important for all parts of, of what we do, of being able to express um, our, uh, express things in, in ways that everybody can understand. I guess I should also add like uh, sonifying as well, or like, or other ways of representing data. I, I, um, I want a better word for this because they, like, yes, we talk about data visualization a lot, but it's all, it's really like ways of, making data accessible to you in whatever whatever form you can uh, perceive. So there's also a lot of really cool work that folks have done in like turning light curves, uh, the brightness of a star over time into sounds uh, so that you can listen to them and perceive them. But uh, okay, but so going back to like, how do we do this? How do we approach visualizing some data? I, it's a, a skill that needs that you like have to develop and you have to practice um, right in the, in the same way that you um, in classes you've spent time learning how to manipulate equations and uh, derive expressions and um, plug in numbers to answer these physics questions and that was a thing that you practiced a lot in your classes I think here visualizing data is something that takes skill of thinking about how do I transform this raw data in some sense into something that I can understand that whatever audience is going to be looking at this can understand. A, all right, this is kind of a silly example, but I think I think it's useful. So again, uh, so we earlier we talked about Cecilia Payne Kapochkin, um, this uh, amazing astrophysicist who figured out that the universes or that stars are made mostly of hydrogen and therefore the universe is also mostly hydrogen there's this like really wonderful um needlepoint map that she made of the cassiopeia a supernova remnant so this was like back in the oh i want to say like the 70s x-ray telescopes were a brand new thing there was this new image uh, taken with an X-ray telescope, so an X-ray image of light emitted by a supernova remnant that was, if you like visualize, think about, imagine what an old imaging data set would look like. It's probably really pixelated and kind of crummy in its resolution, right? So this was, uh, I think it was an image that was maybe like 20 by 20 pixels or something like that, a really, really coarse image. And so uh, she was an avid crafter. And so she and a friend teamed up to make a um, a little needlepoint pattern out of this and then used embroidery floss to color in each individual pix pixel in this image. So it's like, it's a lot of pixels, it's a lot of work. Um, There's a lot of you know, kind of patience and dedication went into this. But I really like thinking about how much better she got to know that data set than if she had, say, just like printed out an image of it and stuck it in a paper or hung it on a wall. Right of this, that there is something really fundamental to the the time that you take working with data and trying to think about what's the best way to express this. Um, to in this case to like scale this image so that I'm converting like photons coming from some particular location in in the sky to a little square of brightly colored embroidery blocks. Uh, I'm, I'm sure she has a good sense for the like the, the structure of that particular supernova remnant that uh, that she had made there. So as a like, I'm not advocating that we should all needlepoint all of our data. That there's like there's only so much you can do with embroidery floss. You can do a lot, but you can't do everything. Uh, but I I do like thinking about this, uh, appreciating the wonder of oh gosh, I can take a data set of a thousand spectroscopic exposures that I uh, took at the Apache Point Observatory three and a half meter telescope, and I can write a few lines of code and convert that into a movie that I can then watch and look for trends here. And then I can 
extract out the um, actual measurements that I care about and look at those propagating through time. And then thinking about how do I account for the noise in this data set? How do I convert this into uh, maybe just a few numbers that I could then summarize along with similar observations of other stars of uh, thinking about the process by which we visualize our data, we are, we're learning about the, the universe in the same way that an artist might by taking their, um, uh, doing their careful observations that they need to, uh, to make a work of art. So a big part of this data visualization that we kind of talked about, um, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to reference earlier conversation. A big part of, oh. <laughs> of uh, data visualization is making the, you know, this information accessible, especially to people who wouldn't otherwise make tons of sense of it, right? So I'm thinking non-scientists or non-astronomers who are interested in taking a look at this. And I think that there's kind of this discussion about the role of scientists in communicating the work that they do to the general public, right? To the civilian kind of non-scientist group of people. And I think that, there, that there's a discrepancy there that has caused some problems, the most recent one being climate change, where a huge chunk of people doesn't believe what science is saying because they don't trust it. They think that it's, it's you know, they've been told otherwise, or they think that it's a lie, or that there's some ulterior motive. Um, I guess I'm just curious what your thoughts are on the role of scientists communicating their work to, to civilian non-scientists to kind of promote a pro-science world. You know, to uh, to shape a world where people trust science and they trust the scientists and the work that they're doing. You know, in in kind of getting rid of you know, bridging that gap. You know, that causes these issues where people don't. You know, they don't buy it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a it's a big question and a hard one. The I actually let me um. Maybe let me first start with the, um, you use this language of um, scientists and non-scientists or like scientists and civilians. Um, and I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on that language that I think we, I think we're all scientists, right? Like we, this is something, um, the like folks who are working in scientific fields, we have more training um, and we have had a lot of practice and we've spent a lot of time doing this. But fundamentally the thing that we are doing is asking questions about the world and testing answers to those in a kind of structured fashion. That's something that I think pretty much everybody does uh, every day in their own way. Like if you've, uh, I don't know, a lot of us have like baked a thing and we left it in the oven too long and it burnt. Um, and so in that case, we have, uh, it was like maybe not the like most fun experiment in the world, but we've done our own little bit of an experiment here of that we're, we were following a recipe, a recipe that was, was hopefully put together by somebody who, um, you know, had had tested things out and figured out this is this is how long you need to bake these cookies for. And so, on the one hand, sure, we could just blindly follow that recipe, um, and the cookies would, would turn out fine. But it's also fine and good for us to experiment with it a little bit too. And like, maybe I like crunchier cookies. Maybe I like gooier cookies. I definitely often cook bake cookies for less time than the recipe calls for because they taste better when they're really gooey. Um, these are all of these like small little experiments that everybody does and is like totally part of the scientific process, right? That you're, you're understanding the world, not just in an at like rote memorization, here are some facts to deal with it, but you can have like, I think every time you make a little um, modification to a recipe, that is, um, that's scientific discovery in, in its own fashion. And so the challenge here, I think uh, that that's not to belittle this, um, this like very real challenge that there are lots of folks who don't believe um, or don't want to believe scientific um, 
results that have a lot of evidence behind them. Climate change being a really good example here. Um, the stopping the spread of a global pandemic right now is another really good example of this. Um, and so there, I think it's, uh, we absolutely have a responsibility as folks who are trained and practice in science to share things that we are learning with the world in an easy to understand way. But I think we also have an, oppor an opportunity to try to share a little bit more of that, the fact that, that science isn't this thing that has to be trusted um, from just blindly, that science is a thing that you can test yourself. You don't have to like, I know you're not gonna be able to like go build a particle accelerator in your backyard and test that um, fundamental physics works the way that those physicists say that it does. But there are, um, there is a way that kind of everybody can get a little bit more involved in thinking about what are the predictions that science make, makes, what are the things that I can do to test those. So like in the case of climate change, Sure, you can't build a new planet and um, mess around with its atmosphere and see what sees what and like you can't like build a new planet, uh, mess around with its atmosphere and see what happens to its climate. But you can like go get three blankets out of the closet and put them on top of yourself and make a prediction about whether that's going to make you warmer or not. Um, and I think you'll find it'll probably make you warmer. But that's a, like, that is actually a pretty good analogy for what's happening in climate change, right? As we pump more CO2 in, into our atmosphere, we're literally just putting um, an extra barrier that makes it harder for heat to escape from us out into space. And so that is, that's a, a connection that, that we on this call are able to make because we've had a little bit more training in, um, in understanding how greenhouse gases work, but I think we can and should take the effort to try to communicate that a little bit more broadly to the to the rest of the world beyond our classrooms. Very well said. So um, kind of getting towards the end here, but we do always like to ask people, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are? Did you I mean, you probably didn't want to study exoplanets when you were a kid, not really a thing, um, but how did, how did you get to where you are? And do you have any advice for somebody who kind of wants to move in that direction, who wants to study exoplanets and get into something like that? Sure, yeah. Um, I, so my parents are both artists. Uh, they're ceramicists, so they make um, uh, um, sculptures of various kinds, some functional stuff, some non-functional stuff. So growing up, I spent a lot of my time traveling to art fairs on weekends, and we would like sell our art to people. Uh, and so that, that was a, a, a fun way to grow up, and I got to meet a lot of really cool people and see a lot of cool art. And uh, we would often go down to Florida. I grew up in Michigan, um, but we would go down to Florida for there's some like big art fairs down there. And we would always take this week where, which I loved because I was like, got to miss school for a week. It was kind of fun. Um, but we would go down to the Florida Keys and we would do a lot of snorkeling. And I always really loved this feeling of sticking my head underwater with a mask on and seeing this like amazing magical new world of all of these like corals and fishes and brightly colored things uh, and like weird sea cucumbers and all sorts of wacky stuff that felt like this whole undiscovered world that was lurking there the whole time but I just never really got you know didn't see it until I, I looked closely and so when I went to college I had like throughout high school I had sort of like I liked science broadly I went to college and I thought I, um, I originally wanted to be a physics major with a little bit of a sense of like, I want to explore and learn new things about the, the world. Um, I, my first semester of college, 
I really actually didn't like being a physics major. I uh, spent a lot of time in problem sessions where there were a lot of uh, a lot of people sh shouting sort of loudly, I know the answer, listen to me. Um, no, I know the answer, listen to me. And I didn't, I like, I really didn't feel like I, I fit in with that community. And so I was like, that's it, I'm done. And so I went and took a semester to go be an art history major. And it was great. I like it. Uh, I read a lot of cool books and I learned a lot of cool stuff and I saw a lot of cool art. I guess I like seeing a lot of cool art. Um, but even after one semester of that, I, I missed this, this scientific way of uh, exploring and thinking and learning. And so I, my sophomore year, I was lucky enough to take a, a friend suggested an astrobiology class that was taught by an astronomer and a chemist and a biologist and a geoscientist and another chemist. And we had, I think in the first week of that class, the astronomer got up and said, all right, well, here's how we go from the Big Bang to the formation of planets. And I was like, what? That's like, that's a thing that you can know? That's amazing. And so that, that kind of got me hooked. And then I uh, went back and took an intro astrophysics class and I was like oh I guess I really like this and then I went back and sort of did all the physics requirements after the fact um but I really li like I was coming at it from the perspective that the, the astro department where I was was really small and had a nice um kind of uh almost family like feel to it everybody was really supportive and and really encouraging of me and so I I felt like oh even, even if I'm a little bit scared of this physics community I have a few people that I can turn to um, that I know will be really supportive and will help me get through the hard parts of it. And uh, having those people was really important for me. And so then uh, from there, I just I kind of kept studying and got really uh, more and more into astrophysics. And by the time I graduated, I, I knew that uh, astronomy was a thing I wanted to do for a career. And so I applied to grad schools and um, was lucky enough to get into a few places. Um, actually got into um, and then wound up going to grad school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, mostly because my then girlfriend's now wife also got into grad school there and so we could find a place that worked for both of us. Um, it was like it was really important that we made that decision for based on our lives in addition to just our, our scientific careers. Uh, and so I really loved grad school. And at the like when I started grad school, I thought, thought I wanted to study cosmology and the um, like smashing simulated galaxies together inside of supercomputers. But I went in, tried to go in with an open mind and met with lots of different professors and faculty and met my thesis advisor who explained like what we could do to study exoplanets and that we were building this survey to look for small planets around small stars. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And kind of just got hooked at that point and, and haven't really looked back. And so I really, uh, now I just really like that the exoplanet community is, um, again, is sort of a relatively, because it's a relatively young field, there, um, it's nice that it's a community that we get to craft a little bit more intentionally. And so I think there are, um, it still like still has a lot of the the biases that are kind of present across um, a lot of physical science fields, but we are we're a little bit better in that sort of our our founding um, many of our our founding scientists are not all old white men, um, right? That we that there are more um, uh, that there have been more women and people of color involved from the start. And we still have a, lo a long way to go to, to match the actual uh, pool of talent that exists out there in the world. But uh, I like that as a community as a whole, it, it's really kind of supportive. So my advice finally for how to get involved in exoplanets is uh, take some classes, uh, learn as much as you can and uh, look for research experiences that are related to like yes related to exoplanets but also stars and also planets this is it is kind of a cool field in that we are we need to have expertise in all of these different areas of this kind of like traditional stellar astrophysics as well as understanding the details of 
planets in our own solar system here. And so I would really say that if you if you're interested about uh, like career in exoplanets, I think it's important if you are at the level of kind of an undergraduate student to seek out opportunities to do some kind of research, whether that whether or not that is explicitly related to exoplanets, it will still definitely help you here. I didn't come to exoplanets until grad school, and so you can definitely uh, switch after the fact. Uh, but just something of that, like getting to practice being a scientist and diving into to doing, to interacting with astronomy and planetary science in a way that is a little bit beyond what you're doing in your structured classrooms. So before we let you go, I have one last question for you, which is, I, this is the only time and I mean this, this is true. This is the only time that I have not seen you wearing what looks like a homemade scarf. Can you tell us about <laughs> that I always see you wearing? Uh, you make them. Sure. Right, you know, let's... Well, it's, I mean, like it's summertime right now, so it's hot. So I'm not like I'm. I so this is. I, I guess we've like mostly seen each other in the in the winter time. Though. Sure. Is uh, key here. Um. Uh, yeah. So I have. Um. Uh, my so my wife and I both knit. Um, the ones that I wear around campus are usually ones that she made. I think I probably helped with a few rows here or there, um, but they were most of them are, are gifts from her. Um, and uh, but we like you might also have noticed that one of the things that I like to do in our like departmental colloquia or seminar is I like to knit while I'm there. Um, and this is in part, this is that I like really like just having something to do with my hands. I'm a kind of fidgety person. And so I can focus better on a, on a, a talk or listening and learning to something if I'm doing something with my hands. So I'll knit and work on something there. Um, but I'll, I'll also, I realized when I'm um, uh, talking about this a little bit last year that another thing that I really like about it is this, um, it's something that makes me feel a little bit more connected to my, uh, my grandma, actually, who, who she originally taught me how to crochet. Um, and then, and that kind of got me hooked on, on doing yarn crafts with my hands. And so all of us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we're bringing our, like, we bring a lot of ourselves to what we do. Um, and that's, that's just as true in science as well. Like we are human beings doing science. And so for me, I am like, I'm me, but I'm also my parents and I'm my grandparents. And uh, I think the have, having a way to kind of like physically remind myself of that fact is really useful for me in um, in navigating my scientific career. Uh, I because I like I love being an astronomer. It is a great job, uh, but it's hard sometimes. It's stressful sometimes. There are things that I'm worried about, and so it's always useful for me to be able to to kind of lean back on the, the strengths that I got from my family, and so in that sense doing uh, doing an activity that, that kind of connects them uh, to, connects me to them really helps me out and I think it's something that a lot of us can do um, as we are um, remembering that when we become scientists or uh, advance in our scientific training because everybody's a scientist um, that as we